Most people think sex is important. 68% of people agree that it's important for a fulfilled life. Religious people aren't very different. They're slightly more likely to think sex is important than non-religious people are. The biggest difference is by gender, though, not religion. Men are twice as likely to strongly agree that sex is important for a fulfilled life. 40% of men, 20% of women strongly think that. But a very similar percentage also think that our society is too sexualized, that there's too high a profile given to sex these days. 66% of people say that. Again, not much different for religious people, slightly higher. And on this one, interestingly, there isn't a big gender difference. We think sex is really important. Look how few of us don't think sex is important. But similarly, we're very concerned about its place in our society. Most of us think there's a problem, and this tiny number of us don't know. So this is something we all have very strong opinions about, which should make it an interesting debate. The ideological uh, aspect of sex is something that concerns me very greatly. And I discovered a tradition that taught me that actually the body um, is something very honourable, uh, very good. There's a very high view of the body in the traditional Christian thinking, which I hadn't particularly come across, and it enabled me to get my life together. Um, I would say it saved my life. I really was on a, a downer, I tell you. And I want young girls today to know that actually sex does not form persons, as Freud taught, and as even the Church of England today teaches. It is, I believe, abstinence that forms persons, your character, becomes stronger through sexual continence that creates stronger societies, and it is the seed, the germ of civilization. So that's the point that I want to make uh, in the conversation tonight. Even students who want to be sexually active, who are interested in getting into relationships, etc., tend to suffer over the long term in hookup culture. And so what it really is, is a culture that is absolutely saturated with, um, with sex. So, so about 80 to 90% of students, depending on the, um, the college that I surveyed, said that you have to be casual about sex. And about half of those students would add, and I wish you didn't have to be. And so there's a, there's a, lot, of, there's a lot of angst with students about living in hookup culture. They want to be sexually active, but most students, but they also don't necessarily want to be sexually active in this particular way. And one of the things that's become clear uh, with the students that I've spoken with is it doesn't seem to occur to them in the middle of all of this um, hooking up and the sense of you have to do this, you can tell people that you're doing it, because hookup culture is often about, it's a social, um, there's, it gives you social capital. One of the things that the students don't seem to ask is what do I want from sex? And they don't seem to know where their desire is in all of this. So, so lots of pressure to have sex, lots of bravado around sex, but not very little reflection on what is sex, what do I want from it, a lot of ambivalence about it. One thing I think is really peculiar about the time in which we live is that we are both puritanical and incredibly easygoing. So, Nowadays, for example, I don't think anybody would think it was appropriate for a movie like Pretty Baby to be run or for an organisation like the Paedophile Information Exchange uh, to promote its points of view. But we're also in, so careful about children that we don't let them walk down the street to go to school. They get carted around by car. When kids now think about going to university, they take their parents with them to open days so we're both very protective and infantilizing of young people, but we also are quite easygoing about early sexual experience, so we're allowing them to be sexualized. And I'm very puzzled by that strange conundrum. Much more worrying for me is the culture of girls, and I think increasingly boys, of being objectified as sexual beings, of being body obsessed, of the effect of pornography, which makes ordinary young people measure themselves against these images of airbrushed perfection, inevitably feeling very undesirable and inadequate as a result. That, to me, is entirely pernicious. <laughs>
Um, but sexual abstinence is absolutely not a Jewish aspiration. Celibates are in no way Jewish role models. The family unit has seen um, very much as the ideal. So I think an anything goes view is rejected. But the opposite extreme, that sex is sinful, has no place in Jewish teaching. And I think that's because Judaism holds as a central principle that people are not meant to be alone. So sex is, I think, part of that. It's seen as a gift to be celebrated, but one to be unwrapped at home, I think. <laughs> but Judaism has had to acknowledge that society has changed. Premarital sex exists, gay relationships exist. I like to think, I may be being a bit optimistic, that the, uh, the rabbinic community and Jewish leadership is struggling uh, with this, whether, while well, not necessarily promoting or approving of those things, that the ethical principles which govern marital relationships would still apply entirely to those relationships with respect and that all humans are created in the image of God. So do I want a sexualized society in which everything and everyone is seen through a sexual lens, where an empty hookup culture that you spoke about is normal? Absolutely not. But is the reverse of that turning things back? Do I want the clock turned back to a time when sex was never spoken about, where gay people were terrified to express themselves, all issues back in the closets? No, I don't. I don't think that, that one can put the genie back in the bottle on certain issues. For example, the, clearly the, ma the major thing that has, that has happened uh, in the last 50, 60 years is that the uh, connection between uh, sex and procreation has been broken. Now, uh, many people would say that that is a good thing and that they wouldn't want to see women uh, having... Uh, so many children that their health is broken, etc. So they, they see that as, a, as a, a good thing. But once you have broken that connection between, pro, um, between procreation and sex, it, it leads you down uh, a path to a place where I think uh, sexual activity becomes another form of entertainment. I think the important thing is, not so much to put the genie back in the bottle, but to educate... Um, children, again, it's this boundaries business, that they are not helpless. That part of being, say, part of the student culture, which seems to be where, where we're focusing quite a bit um, this afternoon, is I think that part of the student culture is also, are you going to take drugs? And are you going to get drunk? And are you going to have sex? And are you going to hand your essays in on time? I don't know. There's a whole, um, there's a whole culture of decision-making that young people who enter um, studying, especially if they leave home, um, are, are going to be making. And, and I think the problem is this image of these completely helpless um, young adults who are unable uh, to, to control their own destinies. Such are the forces that are against them. Now, where are these forces coming from? They're not coming from the parents who are fighting against them. And are we, is it just satisfactory to say it is the media and the internet? What does that mean? Jenny, and then I'm going to ask Linda if you've got any reflections on this process of change. Jenny. Actually, parents are abetting their children in sexualization. I've got a section on it in my book. I kept encountering people who were telling me that their parents had either given them money to go off and buy vodka and they didn't ask any questions about where they spent the night. I met a clergywoman whose mother had actually said to her, if you don't have sex, you'll never get a husband. Um, now, is it any wonder that if parents are the only way you're going to piece together the stories of the groomed children are actually abetting their children in their sexuality, is it any wonder that this scandal remained so worryingly hidden for so long? Uh, most of us probably don't like the idea of government interfering in our personal lives. But I think there is an area where the government could play a role, which is uh, in, in looking at the, the way in which sex is communicated. Uh, and that does have an impact on, on how people see the world. And I think uh, when he was uh, in opposition, David Cameron did suggest that he would look uh, at uh, advertising and regulation in uh, the area of... Um, very explicit 
uh, material being pushed towards children, but I don't think anything's ever come of it. At a, at a lower level and very explicit material, there are politicians, I'm thinking of Claire Short, who campaigned very strongly against the page three of The yes. Sun yes. as a thing. And there have been various political efforts from mm. across the political spectrum to try and address some of these issues. Maureen, yeah, what are you thinking? I think that the Claire Short example is a really interesting one because she was made to look ridiculous um, in that campaign. And there was this very unfortunate idea that, you know, often her own physical appearance was referred to in a very... Um, unpleasant way, that there is this underpinning that somehow we, had to d we have to define ourselves sexually. And I think that education particularly, and I have to say I, I see this as much more of a problem at the moment for girls than for boys, though my goodness the boys are catching up, in terms of the self-esteem and the empowerment of young women, um, that we really do have to somehow educate them um, formally in schools as part of the curriculum, but also families obviously need to set their own standards, but families need to be very involved in this, into convincing their daughters and their sons that they are not defined solely or even primarily as sexual beings. What has driven the significant change over the last 40 years? Catherine gave the example of the decoupling of procreation and sex, and of course that is one of the reasons, but it's a kind of functional driver. I'm after what are the kind of the ideological or the principal drivers that have changed our sexual culture in the way it has changed over the last two generations. Uh, my fear is that sexual health is only seen from the point of view of sexually transmitted infections, and whereas there is a space in school for talking about relationships, health in terms of the uh, psycho, neurological, physiological health, especially of men I'm thinking of here, who are being rewired through their addictions to pornography and things like that. How can education in schools address uh, this issue of sexualization? Children really are at massive risk, partly because the culture is selling sex still, and it goes back to Freud. And he really did, he set religion against sex. Uh, and he said that it was only the weaklings who colluded in the delusion of religion. Only the weaklings colluded by not having sex, by trying to um, justify constraints and restraints. So yes, there is, it's not that religion is anti-sex, it's just that actually, uh, the Christian religion has such a high view of sex and the body, and it understands the need uh, for protection, but it also understands that actually, um, as Jesus himself said, the spirit gives life. The body counts for nothing in terms of life, in terms of real fulfillment, and we have turned that absolutely on its head. And that was Freud. And I think he is still the ghost in the machine. Often programming, at least in the United States, um, will talk about relationships as important. But generally, we are very concerned with educating around, um, around uh, disease and infection and then rape, which are uh, so sexual assault, which is incredibly important. So I, I want to make sure that you all understand I'm not saying it's not important. However, if most of our programming centers around STIs and, and sexual assault, one of the things we're doing is we're reinforcing that um, sex is dangerous, and also it's always explicit. You're always engaging it in such a way that you could get a disease or, or perhaps you're being assaulted. And, and so, so one of the things I think is so, so important that we don't do enough of is educating around sex very broadly and um, because one of, the, one of the things that's missing from the hookup is communication. If you don't, because if you communicate, you might start to like the person, which then gives complications, which means you can walk away not caring about the person because there's strings. And so you learn not to communicate around sex, which is a disaster. Sometimes I think the problem is that a religious voice that's authentic, um, I think we expect, uh, both as receivers and perhaps as givers of this message, that we want the hard line and we want the pure line. And that simply is theory as opposed to how life is lived. I think an authentic view, as I think you've highlighted, if you're saying that one thing is being taught about contraception, but another thing entirely is enacted, 
um, in connection with it, is an authentic view is a nuanced view, and an authentic view is a confused and often conflicted view. And I think if we can perhaps reclaim that from the religious perspective as authentic, I think that might be quite helpful. And if I've got the floor just for one second, I'd like to respond to the other point about how did we get into this mess. And um, it pains me to say this, but I think it's something to do with the rise of a culture of individualism. And it's part of a much bigger picture. I don't think that the sexual problems that we've highlighted are in isolation. I think we have a very weird view of self-esteem and entitlement, and that is reflected in terms of what we can do um, on the pleasure principle and um, how we judge ourselves. I think a lot of that is to do with money and to do with status and to do with being defined sexually in terms of our personal satisfaction and less about creating a responsible and mutually respectful society. But when, it, when it comes to uh, voices of authenticity, uh, I think we ought to ask the question, well, who has got the authentic voice? Is, it, is the authentic voice coming from leaders who have a teaching which people are struggling with or ignoring, or is the authentic voice uh, the voice of the people. Having said that, I'm now going to, in a way, contradict myself, but um, the, uh, the issue with contraception in the Catholic Church goes back to uh, the document of 1968 called Humane Vitae, which is actually well worth a read because it isn't uh, a document that involves uh, a finger-wagging pope laying down the law about use of the pill. It's actually about, in many ways, about the human body um, and about love. And I don't think, in talking about sex this evening, we've actually mentioned the word love yet. Linda, is there anything you'd like to say about any of these questions? Well, I suppose just on, on Nick's um, genealogical, where did it all come from, it's partly economic as well, isn't it, that we are, we are richer and uh, rich enough not to depend upon a family and marriage. That's part of it. And the, the loss of that ideal of respectability, which is partly about economic survival. But also, surely the churches have to um, shoulder some of the blame for where we are, because the reaction I talked about, the wanting a, a society of openness and, 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 and free love and equality, was about... The opposite was repression. And the symbols of repression were your parents and the church. And sex was the key, the key element of repression, of being told, no, you can't do this, no, you can't have pleasure, no, you can't have fun, the inauthentic voice. So there's an extreme reaction to what was perceived as an extreme form of repression. Um, my name is Katie, and I'm a student at SOAS. Um, and my question was for Donna. Um, in the course of any of your conversations with students, um, did you ever find that um, young people who um, held religious beliefs were more likely to... Um, understand and exercise their rights to boundaries over and above um, other young people? Um, what I would say is that it, um, so whether or not uh, someone's faith tradition will affect what their boundaries, if they have boundaries around sex, will really depend on how they practice their faith. So if they are, say, nominally Catholic, and most of the students that participate in the study who identified as Catholic would be what I think what most people would say would be nominally Catholic. Um, the, it had no bearing whatsoever. So the, the Catholic, generally um, what I heard from students who identified as Catholic was when I asked them, for example, how their, how their faith tradition had influenced uh, their sexual decision making or how they felt about sex or what was going on with them um, in terms of their, their sexuality, they would just sort of laugh at the question, like that there could be any influence. What in the world would you expect me to do with what the Catholic church teaches about sex, given what I'm faced with on this campus. So, um, so there was a complete, complete separation. But um, if you had students who were incredibly invested in their faith tradition, so if it was at the center of their lives, and I would say the biggest block of students I could name for this um, would be the evangelical students that I interviewed, it absolutely, you could not, they could not think about sex without thinking about faith. You can't separate those two things. And their lives were all about boundaries. How can I, how can I live the boundaries that are expected of me? And for, um, for some of those students, it was incredibly empowering to have those boundaries. For some students, it was incredibly crippling. 
Um, but all of them were very much concerned <coughs> with trying to live up to those boundaries. I think there's two, there's two issues for, for religions, really. One is that um, you know, if they stand for um, some kind of eternal verities, then they can't sort of tear them up and start all over again. On the other hand, um, we have, um, through um, greater understanding of human nature, through science or, or medical developments or psychology, learned a bit more about human nature and perhaps some of the ideas that religions have had about morality, therefore, in some way, need to change. One of the things that I think is really wonderful about, you know, in our, in our lovely world of crazy technology and the 24-hour news cycle that we live is that, is that religions do offer us, beyond the pelvic conversations, they offer us rituals for slowing down and, and giving us time to think, even if it's for an hour. Yes. And there's no reason why we can't use those to reflect on sexual decision making. And what do I want from a partner? And am I in love or not? And, um, and so, for example, going on a retreat, if you're at a Catholic campus, you can dedicate that toward who do I want to hook up with next weekend? I don't know. Or who do I want to be with? And I think that slowing down is so key. And, and religions can be really useful to help us remember or to reteach us. That's very those interesting. Things. Very interesting. Unfortunately, for most young people, unless they are already very, very committed in their own tradition, the very last place they're going to look towards for guidance in that reflection is religion. And I think religious leaders are unfortunately not the most desirable and accessible uh, re reflectors for uh, somebody's life, that, that, that most people would not feel that's an area that they can turn to for reflection. So there's a massive PR job to be done somewhere to rehabilitate the idea that religious um, organizations and leaders have something um, to offer.